Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Mark Proud. Mark is the VP of Sales at the Proud Automation Division of the RG Group. Uh, Mark, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Yeah, uh, we've known each other a few years, but uh, never done this. Uh, no, I, it's an awesome space, great location, right down so the much. road from my office. So, uh, yeah, this is uh, nice to get to spend some time with you and uh, talk shop. That's a, yeah, good to hang out with you, too. I was just telling more stories when we started. I feel like we do that every time we see each other. Yeah, I, I think that's, you know, one of the one of the cool things about my job, and I think, you know, if I was at a neighborhood party or a, like a networking event or somebody and says, hey, you know, tell me, what do you do? Um, you know, I used to get into, well, you know, industrial automation, we do this, we work with manufacturers, blah, 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 and, and, and you know, I get a lot of blank stares, and <laughs> like, you know, uh, uh, after a while, and most people don't know what industrial automation is. Um, True. So, you know, for the last few years, I've kind of started out by saying, like, have you ever watched the show, um, How's It Made? Um, and uh, how, or how it's made, and and everyone's like, oh yeah, I love that show. I watch it all the time. And yesterday I watched, you know, how guitars were made at uh, the Martin Guitar Facility, and uh, and I'm like, yeah, pretty much my job is to go into those kinds of facilities, and so uh, and and consult and help them identify opportunities for improvement within their manufacturing operations. How we can apply technology to do that. Um, it, you know, it's done through robots and machine vision and a bunch of other cool technologies, um, but for me, like every day at work is a little like like an episode of how it's made. So That's awesome. So, you know, whether it's a CNC facility like Logic, or whether it's a uh, medical device facility or uh, food and beverage, just talking about fruit, food and beverage applications, um, kind of, you know, get to see it all and, and everything in between. Yeah, I was actually looking at some uh, laser resurfacing technologies, interesting, speaking of medical. Have you ever done anything with um, laser etching to like emulate like an acid etch or a, a grit operation? Um, we, we have not. I've, I've seen them uh, used before in various operations. That it's not necessarily something that um, that we do with uh, within our business or uh, at, at either at, at uh, my former company or with RG Group, but um, definitely a cool technology. We, we see a lot of like laser systems for like. Uh, Marketing and marketing and identification. That's so, cool. you know, like, I mean, it's it's not really terribly sexy, but you know, traceability, right? I mean, you you gotta identify uh, important. identify yeah. a serial number of a of a part that's been out in the field, and certainly, aerospace defense kind of really started that market. I one of the the coolest facilities that I've been in is a uh, it's now a, I think a Northrop Grumman facility, but uh, it used to be called ATK or. Uh, uh, Alliant Tactical Systems in Rocket Center, West Virginia. Oh, cool! Uh, they make you know grenade fuses and thirty millimeter tank ammo and and some other really cool stuff. So, That's awesome. You know, getting getting to see uh, projects done at that place where you're you know laser etching basically a two D barcode on the bottom of a tank round. Um, you know, why would you ever need to like trace that back to like its manufacturing? I mean, again. Uh, I'd imagine with some of the new systems and tanks, they might even be scanning that in the tank as it's loaded. I mean, it probably, yeah, I mean, <laughs> the little, uh, you know, uh, prevent user error kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm sure there's plenty of practical uh, uh, purposes, but that, like, uh, laser application, that's what we've seen most uh, is for either traceability or, in, in some cases, more of like a decorative application where you're etching some kind of like logo or you know something like that into a into a part that's awesome yeah no that's that's really really cool i've just i've been going down that rabbit hole at work lately and so i yeah. um i didn't mean to just ask about something super duper specific but i did anyway <laughs> that's, that's all right i mean i think yeah. that you know i one of the again one of the interesting things about doing what we do is you, you i'm not an engineer by trade don't don't really claim to be um, but by working with a lot of smart people and a lot of guys with, you know, degrees and a bunch of letters after their names, you get exposure <laughs> to a lot of, of really cool technology. And you get I exposure. completely agree. And so, you know, things that I never knew existed, things that I would have never had any exposure to, um, uh, you know, have become pretty common in our world and, and things that we get to kind of see and interact with every day. Yeah, that's awesome. And it's always cool when you work on something and then it comes into the public limelight. Like, I remember, 
I mean, I was only an intern at SpaceX in 2013, but I remember seeing the manned, you know, space program there kind of in its infancy before it was announced. And mm-hmm. it's, you know, since been very announced and they've surpassed it with a new rocket that everyone knows about. And so it's, it's kind of cool to be able to talk about that now and just be like, you know. Yeah, I think that... Um, sat in one of those prototype capsules back in the day. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, in, in some... I mean, SpaceX is obviously a super cool organization. They're doing, you know, some, some really amazing things. Um, e- even things that are, are kind of more commonplace. Like, we have clients that are building, you know, people movers or, um, yeah, uh, you know, like um, some sort of, like, heavy equipment or just a, a machine that, I don't know, puts caps on bottles or something like yeah. that. Like, to see something go from, you know... A, a blank sheet of paper to something that's a highly automated, high functioning, very accurate, very fast, you know, piece of, of equipment that does something, you know, millions, tens of thousands of times a day is, is, is pretty remarkable. That's and, and awesome. again, it's always like, I, I look at that as, as someone with a business degree and I'm like, oh, shit, like, <laughs> I'm glad I work with these guys because, you know, they actually know what the hell they're doing. That's great. Do you ever, I mean, and those systems are incredible, by the way. Just every time I go into a plant and I see some of the automation there, I mean, I'm blown away, you know, by, by some of the things I see. Not always, but most of the time. Yeah, it, it's, yeah. It's, it's really interesting because I think we kind of see both ends of the spectrum. You, you walk into some places that you're expecting to be, you know, fully automated. You know, they're, they're large Fortune 500 companies, well-known organizations, plenty of money, and they're still operating like it's 1965. <laughs> um, and then you go into some others that are highly automated, uh, really technology forward, really embracing the adoption of new technology, um, you know, wearables, AI, you know, all, all the kind of the, the bleeding edge stuff. Um, and you never really know what you're going to get until you walk through the door. Because I think a lot of times it's really company culture and the leadership that kind of drive that level of innovation at, at manufacturing facilities. That makes sense to me. Yeah, I remember I was at, um, I probably shouldn't say what, but a certain manufacturing facility. You mentioned traceability. And I saw them putting uh, RFID tags on the product kind of early on in the assembly process and the manufacturing process. And then you know, I was like, what do you do with those after? Like, oh, that's five bucks. We take it back and use it again, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So. You know, RFID is one of those things. We actually created a company in 2006 that was a kind of a spinoff of our automation business that was going to focus primarily on RFID. It was just like when my recollection was like the, the DOD and Walmart both came out with uh, requirements saying that <laughs> all products... Of, of a certain value needed to have RFID uh, tags so that they could be read and, and data could be tracked that way. Yeah. And uh, it, it never really, it's, it's widely used today, but never really took off the way that we thought that it would. And I think the price of tags was a big reason uh, because of that. It I mean, makes sense. If you're putting, even if it's... I think when I last read about it, Walmart was tracking whole pallets of inventory, or am I... Did they, did they change it? Well, that, well uh, yeah, I th- I'm sure they're doing probably much more than that. But, I mean, even if you go into, like, if you went into, like, a Rite Aid or a CVS and bought, like, a, I don't know, uh, razors or some sort of, like, semi-high value yeah, product. Yeah, they that thing off. Yeah, they have that, that little tag in there for that. Um, I, I'm sure the systems are far more sophisticated, but at least in terms of, like, asset tracking using RFID, uh, at least for the, for the clients that we were talking to, just never really took off. A decade ago or 15 years ago like like we thought it, it was going to um, it makes sense I, I, like i said I'm, sh- I'm sure it's kind of a different story today but uh and there's probably well I, the use cases might just be different than what we anticipated because i mean i've seen them in industrial facilities used like i mentioned um i had a client a while ago with ska that was putting them in retail inventory and then using um a certain type of directional antenna to pinpoint where the asset was relative to the antenna yeah. and then basically allow people to grab stuff and shop without ever having to check out. Uh, I think Amazon Go came along and blew them out of the water. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> it's cool for a moment. I, I, I mean, I think that's, that's a really practical you know, commercial use for that technology or similar technology, I think. Until you're buying a deck of playing cards that's worth less than the RFID tag. Yeah, pro- probably. And I, and I think cameras are pro- really taking a lot of 
in, in AI or probably taking some of the applications away from RFID because cameras are so powerful and effective now to identify objects and see things that you know a decade ago you never could. So. That's a good point. Whenever I look at like a Cognex system, I'm super duper impressed with what they can do. And then some of the stuff that the researchers are doing now, I guess is meant to put that to shame. And so, yeah, but I, I think that Cognex is, is an undeniable force in the machine vision space. We've been a, a partner of theirs since uh, 2004, maybe something. You know, so we're, we're coming up on 20 years. That's we've, awesome. We've deployed I don't know, countless hundreds. Well, they're so bulletproof. Of, I mean, well, I, I mean, that's the, the, that's the case. I mean, they, they have industrial protocols built in. The algorithms are rock solid. They work very well. Um, the form factor, the, uh, the, the the hardware design, all of that makes it very easy to integrate into a manufacturing line. Um, I, you know, I, I am curious to see where that space goes because, you know, you you have more megapixels in your phone, um, and that that camera costs you know Apple thirteen cents, <laughs> and and Cognix is selling cameras for you know. Ten, fifteen thousand dollars. I mean, there's some obvious, you know, lower end ones that are less than that, but you know, a five megapixel camera is north of ten grand. So, I, I mean, they're 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 a great partner of ours. Um, it it feels like in most other technology platforms, though, prices are being driven down. I mean, cameras are everywhere at this point. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see kind of how that uh, how that space kind of moves. Will will manufacturers still be buying? Yeah, you know, six, eight, ten thousand dollars smart cameras a few years from now, or will we have edge devices that are run in open, open AI or open other you know algorithms that that are doing the same kind of. Do you see that on the horizon, like lower cost sensors and and kind of hardware entering into industrial automation? Because I guess I always in my head like looked at that as like a, just a different market with different requirements and. I mean, I've had my iPhone serviced, you know, like twice since I bought it because, sure. uh, you know, it's not the most robust. But some of those industrial systems are out like 20, 30 years, you know, and still going strong. I, I think the, the hardware piece of it uh, is, is really um, a differentiator. Um, you know, to put something out on a, on a manufacturing line where it's going to get, you know, kind of, you know, it's going to have to withstand the environment. Yeah, right? it's so going to get beat up. The, the temperature swings. It's going to get knocked around. It's it's going to have to you know deal with dust, dirt, you know the the debris that sometimes happens out on the on the plant floor. So I think that will always be the case. Um, but you know, the the software piece of it, I, I think, still has a lot of room for development and improvement. Um, and, and I think we'll see some, like, we're, um, uh, I, I had just in the last week or so my first kind of real world exposure to um, uh, machine vision technology that AWS is developing. Oh, cool. That you can download from their, you know, website and, um, you know, use their tools that they have to be able to do things like, you know, identify edges on a box and, Read barcodes and That's identify awesome. characteristics. I mean, it's you can do that any webcam. You can do yeah. I mean, they're I, whatever. We're using an Intel RealSense in that particular application, but cool. I mean, you could use pretty much any thirty. Those are like two hundred bucks too. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. a lot less than the Cognex system. Yeah, so, so I th I think um, when when you have companies like Amazon or AWS that are getting into that space, I think it's it has you know a real ability to kind of challenge the norm. Um, now again, I, I think Cognix is a fantastic company. They're financially very strong. They've they've acquired a bunch of really uh, interesting startups, and they've rolled out some um, um, you know some some really advanced features, both in like three D systems and and some machine learning algorithms that I think are certainly new to the uh, to the industrial. Oh, I'd be interested to see the three so. D offerings. I haven't looked at them in a while. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know used for um, in logistics applications, to be able to measure, you know, to do volumetric measurements. So or, cool. Oh, like the uh, like the some, some kind of like a dimensioning system. Yeah, or, I've seen those. Okay. Um, but but also to be able to, you know, if, if a you know if manufacturer was making a, you know, a Yeti mug, um, you know, to be able to to do both two D and three D inspections with one 
cameras is something that's that's a very real uh, thing that, that Cognex can do. Today. Yeah, that's so, huge. I mean, if you can just <coughs> blow it through a conveyor and have it go through a Cognex. That's yeah, I mean, that, that, and that's that's what ninety five percent of most of the customers are doing. Um, and, and I think what they've also been really successful at is shifting gears going from this manufacturing floor into um, the warehouse and logistics space that's just kind of exploded. Um, and I think you, you'll see a lot of robot companies have really shifted gears. You know, there's some really interesting early stage companies that are primarily going after uh, robot applications in the logistics space. Was it, I think it was like one or two years ago that, and I, I might be wrong on this, but like that sector overtook self-driving, one of my friends was telling me. I hadn't heard that, but I wouldn't be surprised by that at all because it's uh, it's a really large space. I, I was at a, uh, I guess it was in October, um, uh, there was a, a autonomous mobile robot conference in Memphis. Oh, cool. And they were, uh, in Memphis because that's where FedEx is headquartered and they were kind of a, uh, <laughs> yeah, a premier sponsor of the event. But, you know, they, they had a, a, a leadership team of their, you know, what I'll call operational excellence uh, capacities that basically stood on the, uh, on the stage in front of every, you know, a who's who of every, you know, uh, notable robotics company in the world and were saying, this, this is where our headquarters are. We have 6,000 jobs in Memphis that we can't fill. Um, I, I think they, they said they've gone so far as they're busing employees in from like Mississippi um, to, to, Holy crap. to do work at facilities in Memphis because there are just a, uh, enough available workers there. Um, and they were saying, we, we need to, our jobs, talking from FedEx's perspective, our job is to go find the technology that can perform the work of the thousands of open jobs that we have that we can't fill. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> and, um, you know, and it's a whole host of others uh, of, of stuff, but I mean, they're investing significantly yeah. as is. And they're pretty UPS progressive as a company. I mean, just having interacted with them, I, I really, really like the culture there and the way those guys, you know, seem to think. I mean, they strike me as very results driven and, you know, kind of progressive. I think when your business is as competitive as theirs and you have to, you know, somebody drop something off in a, in a box in one corner of the world and guarantee <laughs> that it's, it's going to go to the other corner of the world by 8 a.m. the next day. I mean, you've got you've to have some pretty reliable systems in place to be able to, to do that. And so. not lose a single box or lose very few, you know? So. Yeah, I, I think, like, there's, um, as as um, maybe as unsexy as uh, uh, companies like uh, a FedEx might be, or I think about like airlines uh, all the time too. I mean, the coordination and the operational systems that need to be in place to keep those kinds of companies operating on time, you know, day in and day out. Like, you know, everyone gets pissed off because a flight gets delayed or a yep. crew. I mean, there's, everyone has, a bunch of you know horror stories uh, around that, but in the grand scheme of things, when you think of how many airplanes are flying everywhere and all of the the stuff that needs to happen in order to get that you know uh, people to where they need to be, I mean it's it's pretty remarkable. And technology, I think, is driving a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would agree. I mean, it, maybe this is also kind of unglamorous, but I mean the fact that we can predict the weather now—we've been able to do it since World War II. I'm pretty sure in some capacity. But, yeah. I'm I mean, sure there's a joke in there about uh, can we or you know <laughs> you're more accurate or whatever. But yeah, I mean, I I, I agree. I think that um, uh, you, technology is is so pervasive that it's touched almost every aspect of our world nowadays, and and, and almost every industry and, and facet of every industry. Yeah, yeah, it's a good way of looking at. It. Yeah, I think that you know the adoption of of technology. I you know we used to spend. I, maybe I don't know, six, eight years ago, we would spend a fair amount of time in front, when we would visit with a prospective customer and sit across the desk face to face, we would spend a lot of time trying to convince them that automation was a good investment and that they should do it and that they ought to do it. Um, and we do virtually none of that anymore. Nowadays, everyone has well thought out uh, in some cases, not well thought out, but they, they have you know, <laughs> plans and initiatives 
to adopt technology, to adopt automation, and, and now it's more about are we the right team, do we have the right experience, can we deliver within their budget or with, within their, um, uh, their time frames. Uh, it's, it's, you know, there's very few companies we talk to nowadays that are like, yeah, we're, gonna, we're kind of on the fence with this automation thing. We're going <laughs> to we're 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 wait and see how, uh, how things play out. Yeah, we've got 30,000 people working, just doing just fine, yeah. you know. So, you know, and I think... Never had an issue with, you know, we can't fill all these jobs. <laughs> never had an issue I, with somebody getting Yeah, married. I mean, I, I have never seen a, a labor situation at our clients uh, like we are today. I mean, yeah. every client... Yeah, every client we pull into, I mean, they've got billboards out front. They've got signs in the lobby. They've got, like, applications at the front door. Um, you know, they're, they're making every effort they can to staff up in a way to, to you know, keep their business humming and, um, and they're all struggling mightily, but it does, it's not, it's not just manufacturing. I mean, we are too, right? We can't hire enough CNC machinists at FormLogic. I, uh, yeah, that's where I was going. I mean, it's pervasive in, in almost right. every industry. I, I, uh, I mean, it's a few months ago now, but I, I was out near Hershey and checked into a, a Hampton Inn and... Uh, there was two people working at the entire hotel. Uh, went up to the third floor to go into my room. There were like mattresses leaning up against the hallway. <laughs> uh, there was garbage everywhere. Uh, or, you know, uh, uh, a lot of people down in the lobby were you know waiting to file a complaint because the rooms weren't clean. Uh, I mean, it was it was a disaster. Yeah. Um, it was all because they just didn't have the people that they once did. Yeah, makes sense. I'm not sure what the answer is. Um, it feels like I, I don't know, every few weeks find myself in a conversation where somebody says like, where's everybody at? Like, everybody that used to be working, where, where are they now? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I mean, it, it's amazing how many places you go that, you know, they're... Yeah, I kind of wonder too, because, you know, it's collecting unemployment, maybe in a better job. And who the hell knows? <laughs> yeah, I, I know. There's certainly no easy answer, but uh, left the country. <laughs> that's possible. I, you know, I think, but but what speculating? But what, probably not that. But, <laughs> but what that has uh, resulted in is, is are certainly some some additional opportunities for organizations that are in uh, the technology space or an automation space or a robotics space. So. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, it's interesting how. I mean, obviously the whole pandemic wasn't a positive thing, but from an automation perspective, I mean, I think it really, um, you know, a lot of holdouts were converted during that time. And Yeah, no, no doubt. Yeah, was, uh, no, no doubt that that's the case. And, um, uh, and, I, and I think we're just at the beginning, um, quite frankly. I, I think there's, there's a long... Uh, uh, long, long road ahead of us in terms of automation. I, I remember, and I'm, I'm going to kind of make up the, the quote because I don't remember uh, exactly, but um, you know, we were uh, we were one, uh, a very early um, partner with Rethink Robotics, which was a oh cool a um, you know in 2013 announced the world's first collaborative robot, and uh, and actually they did so at the Robo Business Conference and. 2012 in Pittsburgh. It was the first public unveiling. I didn't know we had one of those in Pittsburgh. That's the, cool. Yeah, the first unveiling of, of the Baxter robot was was uh, was in Pittsburgh, and you know Rodney Brooks, who you know one of the world's foremost roboticists and you know highly highly respected uh, roboticist. Uh, you know, I remember following him around at that conference, and it was like the closest thing I've seen to like like following Mick Jagger around for the day. You know what I mean? Like there were like hordes of people that were all just, you know, trying to get a piece of him. And That's awesome. And, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, part, part of their um, uh, mission, which, which I loved, was the idea that we can't continue to chase low-cost labor around the world uh, to, to outsource manufacturing. It, it, at some point, we're going to run out of places to go. Um, and so if, if we think, you know, their mission was to develop a low cost, it's a pretty progressive to, vision, to be honest, yeah, like a low cost, easy to use robot that would help American manufacturers keep manufacturing operations in the, in the U S. So if we could do the, 
the, the, the mundane, you know, um, monotonous tasks through easy to deploy low cost robots. We'd be able to manufacture more here in the U.S. And certainly, you know, that the, the ending for that company didn't turn out to be yeah, what everybody the kind of flopped, had, uh, right. had hoped. But uh, at the same time, Sawyer was a better product. I thought Sawyer was a better product. We we frankly had a fair amount of success. Uh, you know, the, the 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 in comparison to the competition, it still missed the mark in a number of areas. Universal Robots yeah. came uh, shortly thereafter, and, and the, you know, just. Met but I mean, they wouldn't have been able to do that without um, Heartland or what? Um, sorry, I'm blanking on the name. Well, Heartland was re was Rethink's name. That's what I meant. They, Rethink, before they, yeah. Before they rebranded to uh, for some reason, Rethink, Rethink yeah. just was escaping me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, uh, you are has been met with tremendous success. I mean, they're they're a huge uh, organization now, and and had you know acquired I think two hundred eighty five million. And this is bef this is not bad know, money. Five six years ago, maybe before. Crazy money was being thrown out to robotics companies all over the place. Who was the but, acquiring firm? Do you remember? Uh, Teradyne. Nice. I didn't yeah. know that. That's yeah. interesting. Uh, yeah, T Teradyne has invested in a number of, of uh, uh, they own Mir, uh, too. So oh, cool. robot companies uh, and uh, AutoGuide, which is a uh, uh, large format AMR manufacturer, uh, fork trucks and, That's and awesome. tuggers. Um, and, and I think they've acquired some other uh, smaller outfits that do machine vision and some other things but some big uh, moves from Teradyne. yeah uh but but um it's a long way to get to my point with uh with rethink which was you know uh, i remember seeing a presentation from them where, where they were talking about how in a typical manufacturing facility only some number like 10 percent of the tasks in that that were occurring in that facility that were quote unquote automatable had actually been automated so you know you know, robotics are you know pretty pervasive and you've got industrial robots and collaborative robots that are everywhere but in terms of the tasks that can be automated within a, a manufacturing facility we're just kind of scratching the surface and and you look at warehouse and logistics operations and it's even further behind the curve I mean they're they're just you know getting getting started so you know you, you don't have like, places like Ford and Boeing and GM and Procter and Gamble. I mean, those those organizations have been very highly automated for a long time. But you know, a place like you know FedEx, um, I mean, they're just beginning to use robots in a way that's significant. Oh wow! Yeah, I guess you're right. I mean, that's interesting. I mean, I, you know, I, I guess I I should make a, a blanket statement about an organization like FedEx in terms of how much they've adopted robots. But from what I've seen, and I've been into a number of their facilities. I mean, they're highly automated in terms of material handling. They've got conveyors and sortation systems all over the place. The, you know, the, the barcode tracking systems and the software that moves all that stuff is very highly automated. But in terms of actually using a six axis robot or a mobile robot. To like you, load and unload yeah, and I mean, things of that just, nature. Just kind of getting started. Yeah, that makes sense. That's That was my observation as well. You know, I, I should have started out. I think, um, I should have congratulated you, I, I think, this is, well, I don't know if this is episode 50 for you, but uh, I think you've got 49. Yeah, this will be episode 51 when it Damn. comes out. I'm sorry. Oh, man, I, I thought I was, I thought I was going to be the nice round number of 50. I, anyway, I, can, I can bring you again in a round number. This is fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 50 episodes, though. That's, that's pretty cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's been fun. I mean, I, I started it off, you know, to, to advance the career and, you know, just show off the people I knew and how smart I was and all that bull crap. But now I just have fun talking to people like you and, and yeah. getting to bullshit with my friends. And so I, I really enjoy making them. Well, I, that's what keeps me I going. I appreciate you inviting a, you know, a, a guy with just a bachelor's degree and who spent most, of his, most, most, of his, most of his time in, uh, you know, sales or business development roles. So uh, I, I actually it. double majored in business and computer science when I went to school. Because yeah. I wanted to do business, but my parents would have disowned me if I hadn't done something technical. So I, I felt like that was my back door to getting a business degree. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think that, um, not that I regret. I always I'm not up sure. to the sales guys. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I would have fared well uh, going through like an engineering or an IT kind of program or comp sci program. But I can't imagine you'd be bad at it. Like you seem to understand the principles pretty well. Uh, I, I, I do... Um, now maybe it was more of a of an interest or you know an ability to apply myself back in the day for that, but uh, um, you know I, I 
I didn't have a particular affinity for technology, um, you know, in my high school or maybe even early college years. I was more interested in like startups and business. And, and you know, my first job out of school was a um, a startup in Pittsburgh that uh, was was doing e-commerce software development. Right, so this is back in um, uh, 99 or 2000, so it was just kind of on the heels of the, of the <laughs> dot-com bust. Probably not the best time to get into, uh, uh, I mean, into, that's how you into the startup <laughs> yeah, uh, world, but uh, but yeah, they, they were looking to raise money to kind of kind of you know further develop their own e-commerce software software platform. Uh, after about nine months, that didn't happen, and they went from 30 some employees to six in like three weeks <clears throat> and um uh and so you know i began to think like you know what what am i what am i going to do next i mean I, I liked the small business aspect of it i like being able to kind of having the opportunity of putting my thumbprint on um on on the, the uh, and having some impact on yeah, the business well, i always liked your style in terms of that too i mean yeah i i I don't know that I would fare well. I mean, RG Group is um, the largest company I've ever worked for. It's a 130, 140 employees uh, in that range. Um, you know, close to family-owned business, uh, full of great people. Um, but it's still, from a from a size standpoint, ten times larger than any other organization I've ever worked for. Oh, wow. So, um, so I mean, that that is uh, different for uh, for sure. But um, uh, but I, I I could never really see myself working for you know a uh, a company that's you know a Fortune 500 Fortune 50 kind of company where you've got you know 10,000 people. No matter what your role is, it, it, I, I feel like uh, it, it's tough to kind of see the work that you're doing and, and the direct output that comes as a result. Yeah, when you see that when you interface with Fortune 500s as you do and as I do and have. Yeah. And. Uh, I remember there was one kind of anecdote, just to say another war story, but I was uh, at SKA and this company approached us and they said that they wanted to be more agile and they just laid off like a pretty good percentage of their staff. So there was fear in the room, you know, and everybody was yeah. really worried they were going to get fired and nobody knew why they wanted to be agile. They just knew that some executive had told them they had to be agile. <laughs> And so they were like, well, what about, you know, the requirements diet? Well, that's not really part of Agile. Like, well, what yeah. about, you know? <laughs> so it was, it was kind of funny to see that. Um, I, I mean, I think there's people that thrive in that environment, and obviously large companies are... For sure. You know, I'm not what, one make, of them. what make the world go round, right? Yeah, um, I agree. It's, it's just something I've never had much of a, uh, any exposure to, A, and, and B, frankly, much of a desire uh, to be open. And, and again, maybe my perception is, is I, off on that. But. I have an uncle who's was a Fortune 500 CEO for a lot of his <laughs> career, and it's interesting. Like, I mean, he, I've probably heard him swear once, <laughs> like my whole life of him being my uncle. Yeah. Um, never an ounce <laughs> of you know political controversy. I remember he made a comment that favored. Um, you know, like one presidential candidate over another once at his daughter's wedding, and he made them turn off all the cameras before he made the comment. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, he didn't want to be seen to do that as a representative of the company. <laughs> if you dig hard enough, you can probably figure out what it is. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a different world. I mean, you know, like the level of constraint that you're operating under, I mean, like the, the level of formality, like the... You know, the amount of people that in that family were introduced to me as like Mr. So-and-so or, you know, like Ms. This or, I mean, you know, like you don't see that outside of grade school normally if you're in the startup world. So. Yeah, there's, there's definitely, in, in the little exposure that I've had, a, a level of reverence that comes with some roles within those organizations that uh, it almost seems, not, not that they don't deserve it, but it just seems strange to me just because it's... It's something that I haven't, you know, had much direct uh, experience with. Yeah, no, that makes sense to me too. I knew I knew one other Fortune 500 CEO. Um, it was the CEO of MTV Networks, uh, which owned Nickelodeon and Universal Studios. Yeah. And, MTV, and now he works for the Cats Radio Group as their CEO, which is like iHeart Radio and a bunch of others. Mm -hmm. And he's my dad's buddy from high school, mm -hmm. which is how I knew him. 
But uh, that I, guy, I, 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 like, I also very, like, he says nothing, but he comes off, like, magnanimous. It's weird. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say, I, like, I think if you're, if you're, like, the CEO of, like, MTV or Nickelodeon, like, I guess my perception of that person would be somebody that's kind of like a, you know, a, a hip, uh, creative kind of type. But yeah. I think when you're dealing with organizations of that size, it's still about, like, you know, quarterly earnings calls and, uh, that's exactly uh, it and so he was he's always silent like he never really says a word you know he's yeah. just more of an observer than a talker I mean all the stuff you're told you're supposed to do as a salesman yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah. So, yeah, he's, he's trained well yeah exactly I, like the best you know and so I, I, both those guys are like that that I've interacted with so it's interesting to see yeah, I, yeah. Um, but, but I, they're normal people if you like really like mm-hmm. really drill in and get to know them I mean there's things I won't repeat that I've seen where it's, that's just a dude. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, you know, I think I think that maybe part of that uh, like spills over into my you know work life a little bit in, in terms of our, our um, uh, you know my job at our company as as we help others automate is um, personally I get more enjoyment out of seeing a startup or an early stage company and working with them on a project that has the ability to really kind of you know, move the needle for one or both of our businesses. Um, now, unfortunately, you know, we wind up doing work for a lot of large companies because, you know, they can scale yeah. and they have the most opportunity <laughs> and the most needs. And, yeah. and, you know, we still spend a fair amount of time there. But, but personally, it's really enjoyable uh, for me to work with some smaller, regional, you know, small and medium-sized manufacturers that, that are just, you know, down-to-earth, good, you know, uh, Western PA, Pittsburgh area kind of people. Yeah. Um, and you, you have an opportunity to kind of develop some, you know, relationships that way more so than if you're, you know, just, uh, you know, responding to an RFP that's coming from a, you know, a purchasing agent at some, you know, ABC global, you know, organization. Yeah, it makes sense to me. I mean, that's, that's a pretty beautiful outlook. I, um... I've done work for a lot of startups, probably hundreds, and um, maybe not as many as you. But I, I well, I, I think I think we're pretty similar in that sense. But you probably might have done um, more uh, than I have. I, I, you know, like working with um, like the guys at Capson Robotics. Like, I, you know, I got to meet Jared and Mark whenever they. Oh were, yeah. You know, I, I think maybe they were at uh, Alpha Lab Gear. Like when they were just they days. were just getting yeah. you know started and, and made a connection with them and uh, uh, you know we've been working together in, in small capacities trying to find you know projects uh, together for the past you know six years or whatever it's been that's awesome we have a capstan system you can't see it but behind the TV there's a robot with a capstan system on it yeah yeah so I mean I, I think that what they're out to try to do is is solve a really difficult challenging but you know, gigantic problem. And uh, I mean, I, I, it's probably one of our biggest challenges when we go, when, when we're at a manufacturing facility and, and they're not savvy when it comes to automation and they say, hey, we want to go automate this process where, you know, we're taking up, you know, a part out of a box and then placing it into this press and then taking it out of the press and putting it in on a conveyor and packaging or something. And um, and what they don't realize is the, the, the dexterity and the, the vision that it takes. You know, a human can reach into a box of random parts and quickly find one, yeah. uh, grab it, orient it properly, you put it in, you, you don't even think about it. Yeah. And, uh, but that's super difficult to do. When well, you got rotary computer. drum feeders, like depending on the part, I mean, there's yeah. a bunch of ways to solve it that don't require... Yeah, Complex but but that but those don't provide the kind of flexibility that most manufacturers need. Oh, well, for sure, and I mean, like with my work at FormLogic, I mean, we specialize in high mix, low volume production. Yeah, and it's a whole different set of software you need to do that versus you know, the old school of you know like we're gonna make you know, fifty thousand of this thing and. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think a lot of that like you know, uh, low. Low mix, high volume stuff. I mean that that that's that's the easy stuff to automate, and I think that's kind of the low hanging fruit that likely has already been automated, particularly at larger companies. Um, it's the stuff that you know you're making fifty of these or a couple hundred of these, and, and frankly, that's the way that the world is moving because 
you know, we're consumers are buying things that are highly customized now. Yeah. You're buying things that are kind I of. I feel like that's like what Toyota has been advocating for for decades. I mean, in a way, like yeah. it's, it's sort of roundabout. But I've been reading like, is it Shingo Shingo's like the Smed System book? Oh, I'm not familiar. Uh, it's kind of cool. It's about um, so Smed is. I'm gonna get. I'm probably mispronouncing the guy's name even, but it's a guy that worked for the Toyota. Uh, you know, worked yeah. for Toyota for years and consulted all over the world. And uh, Smed is single minute exchange of dye. So the goal with that kind of system is like single piece flow. So if I can take one thing and get it all the way to the end of production without having to make a batch of like you know a thousand or fifty or a hundred or whatever, that's ideal. And so the only way that's practical is if changing tooling doesn't take a whole lot of time so he would get tooling change over times down from like four hours to like you know minutes yeah, right. and so i don't know it's kind of interesting to get and then what i like about it as opposed to some of this generic six sigma shit you read you know which comes off a little bit circular and so i mean it's it's valuable but i think when you when you just read about it it comes off as like stupid and cult-like yeah um what i like about this book is that it's um it gives real examples. It's like, you know, this press was doing this and I found out by removing these motions we could make it go better and we were able to make five more units while we were spinning it up, you know? Sure, yeah. And, so, and, and I think it's those small changes that based on volumes and over time make a, a big difference for, uh, for a lot of manufacturers. It has nothing to do with automation necessarily, but just trying to, you know, kind of squeeze every ounce of juice out of the oil. Well, and a lot of times the logical conclusion is automation now. I mean, it's... It's, it certainly could be, but I, I think oftentimes there's there's waste and in, in processes beyond that too. I mean, how how material gets to the place where it's needed, or how much space it's taking, or how much you know uh, uh, you know time operators are spent doing things that maybe could be done elsewhere. I mean, it, it, you know, there's and that's not our world, but there's a lot of you know companies that that do good consultant work on the, you know all of those kind of lean. Uh, or six eight or whatever principles. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I found myself walking across the shop floor at Form Logic today, and I, I think I left my notebook at my desk, and I had to walk back, you know, like probably like a couple hundred feet. And I'm like, fuck, <laughs> <laughs> wasted motion. What am I doing? <laughs> yeah, I think that. Uh... I, I'm not sure there'll ever be automation that solves that for you. But, no, uh, no, for sure. It's just uh, make, taking better notes and you know, being organized. But yeah. every, every now and then, you know. But I, I you know, I think that um, in, in some respects, like the world that I live in, like I, I think that there's companies doing some really remarkable, like futuristic, uh, you know, change the world kind of stuff using, you know, AI to, for early detection cancer or using. Uh, you know, even a lot of the autonomous uh, vehicle stuff that's happening, um, you know, is really you know game-changing kind of stuff. That, you know, the the world that I live in is, it, it's kind of like practical like automation. You know what I mean? Like it's it, we're not like doing something that's never been done before in most cases. I mean, certainly there's nuance to a a certain customer's product or their processes. Um, you know, but oftentimes it's like let's take commercial off-the-shelf equipment let's you know do some some you know custom engineering work to kind of design it in a way that fits this particular customer's need but um, you know it's 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 often like just kind of blocking and tackling um, is is a large portion of, of what helps uh, a lot of these companies I mean, yeah but I mean why reinvent the wheel when you can do that you know like that I, I feel like a lot of the, the startups like you know forgive me for saying so and I mean, you know, obviously not all of them, but are, are just so quick to want to come up with a solution that doesn't need to exist to a, a solvable problem. And so, yeah, I you mean, know, it's... if you can take something off the shelf and plug it in, you should do that first before you, I mean, maybe not in some cases. I, you know, I, uh, like, like in, in, in one respect, I, I, in some respects, I, I respect the hell out of companies that are going out and raising money with a really good idea um, or a concept that has the potential to turn into a good idea or a good business. Um, and there's companies that are raising boatloads of money today that are that are doing that. Some, are, some will make it, some won't. Uh, I'm not sure that we wind up with the advancements that we have without 
investors and entrepreneurs willing to take a risk on ideas that have a decent chance of not painting out, right? So, um, so I, you know, I, I, I love the fact that, especially Pittsburgh, a good healthy robotics and, and automation ecosystem around, you know, the startup community. Um, are there companies out there that are raising, you know, tens of millions of dollars that, uh, you know, that I look at and I'm like, really, that's, that's, that's what they're doing? They, yeah. Okay. Like, you know, good for them, I guess. Um, but uh, it, it's tough to see like practical uh, usages for, for that. But, um, you know, I, who am I to judge? Like, yeah, for sure. I mean, well, the funniest one, I mean, like, yeah, this is one you've heard of, Juicero. Do you remember this? So it was, it was a, they raised over a hundred million dollars. Oh, like a juicer or something? Yeah, for a juicer. Yeah. <laughs> and what it would do is it would take like a, a Capri Sun bag full of like pomegranate pips and squeeze it with like a 4,000 pound press. Yeah. And the idea was like, you know, cold pressed juice. And there's this ABV video on YouTube where the guy, it's this guy that like tears apart power tools and talks about how well made they are and uses like Canadian slang, but he tears <laughs> apart this thing and he's like, oh my God, this is so well made. You know, they, they must have hired a contract engineering group. You know, <laughs> he's like, this is amazing. Um, but the point was that I think they were selling it for like four grand. He's like, even at four grand, they were selling it at a loss. I might have the yeah. pricing wrong, but yeah. you know, whatever they were selling for, like it, it was not enough to cover the cost of material for an assembly for, you know, it was like that close tolerance CNC machine you know, just overbuilt stuff. Um, but then where they were hoping to make their money was a subscription model. So they were selling uh, the, the yeah. Capri Sun bags of fruit, yeah. you know, and it was just silly because, you know, it was basically VCs that were insular and they saw this thing that they would pay for, but, you know, I mean, you or I, I would not. <laughs> so. I, I mean, I, I think that the um, this whole subscription model thing is really, I think, has become... Uh, you know, pervasive in, in our worlds, and I think we've kind of accustomed to to, um, uh, to using that model in a lot of cases, and, and I think a lot of robotics companies are adapting that kind of you know robot as a service model as well. But um, uh, it, it, there certainly have been some cases where the companies you know given away the hardware to try to make it up on the on the back end, and, and maybe you have you know maybe you have some successes and. and I'm sure uh, Pelotons are going to maybe we'll use them as yeah, an example. actually, that's I mean, a great example. I mean, they're, I mean, not an inexpensive product. I have no idea what the profitability is on, on making the bike itself, but at I don't know, I'm not a member, but out of 50 bucks a month or 70 bucks a month for the su subscription to their uh, to the wrapper. Uh, I thought about getting it. I mean, I'm not a member either, but I'm like, yeah, that'd be yeah. nice. You, you know, could probably get them pretty expensive. Less expensive now, than right? a trainer. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, and I think they, I mean, through the pandemic, their business just kind of went through the roof, and I think it's come back to earth a little bit, and I think they uh, retracted some, some you know, growth plans, and unfortunately, I think I had to lay off a bunch of people. But um, I mean, it happens. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think they're a, a great example of uh, um, a company that, Actually, what I'm really intrigued by are companies that have taken, uh, maybe Yeti is a good example of this, like a really mundane object that you would never think about, you know, paying $400 for, but creating like a high-end market for something like coolers or coffee mugs or, you know, stuff stuff like that. I mean, you know, like this one that yeah. I have here, I mean, you, you could... Yeah. You know, there's knockoffs all over the place now, but you know. What do they go for, if I can ask? I I mean, this thing is probably forty bucks, thirty bucks. Now, what differentiates that from like a twenty dollar one or like a fifteen dollar one? The brand. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, probably not much. I I mean, I haven't done like, you know, detailed like studies on like the temperature of my beverages over you know a certain <laughs> period of time or anything, Fair. but <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, you could get that same thing at you know Walmart or on Amazon for uh, you know. Eight bucks maybe, or you can yeah. buy the Yeti that's thirty nine ninety nine. Yeah, well, I'm willing to spend like a little more money for a good thing. I mean, I just bought like a Bissell vacuum for like four hundred bucks. Yeah, and, but it's a great vacuum. <laughs> like yeah. you know, it's it's awesome. I, 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 Dyson is maybe another yeah. good example in that space as well. That I think they were the first one to you know come out with a you know a four hundred dollar vacuum, and you know they all the the engineering and the science to kind of you know behind that. I remember seeing commercials with. Uh, Mr. Dyson, whatever his yeah, name is. Who the hell is going to buy that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, Sir Mr. Dyson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I see all the... Uh, they knighted you know, him, all the, I think. All the engineering <laughs> that, go, that went into that, so... Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I you know I'm interested in, in that, but uh, uh, I guess more than anything, I, I love seeing when those kinds of companies, uh, uh, like Vitamix is a, is a Vitamix great, is, is a great success so cool. story. I mean, yeah. they're like a, a Cleveland area based company that uh, has grown like crazy. So, um, Blendtec was an interesting one. Uh, I'm not they just they did those will it blend videos on YouTube with the blender where they would put like an iPhone in a blender yeah. and, and I mean they, they sold a bunch of blenders yeah. for like three four hundred bucks. <laughs> I, you know I think that that um, doing kind of content marketing or, or you know video uh, marketing like that is pretty genius. Uh, you know yeah. like how, how do you differentiate your blender versus somebody else? Blender? Have a Duna lab coat blend an yeah, iPhone. Yeah, you, <laughs> you throw a bunch of random crap in there and you blend it and uh, you know see what happens. If nothing else, you yeah. get some eyeballs on on the product and the brand and video. That I mean, it's impressive too. I mean, they would put like marbles in the thing and just hit go and yeah. would vaporize them. I mean, I was like, I kind of want one of those. <laughs> like, <laughs> just just for that. You know, yeah, you, exactly. You, know, you don't actually want to bake smoothies. You want to throw a bunch of marbles. <laughs> yeah. See, if uh, I, I bet if uh, like if like with my my kids, like that's probably what if they saw that video, they'd be like, uh, I, you know, ask for that for Christmas or something. Just because, like, <laughs> so they can blend. Let like... me just you know blend some stuff. Hot Wheels cars and, <laughs> and anything they could get their hands on, probably. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I think um, maybe that's a, a good segue into. Uh, you know, one of the, the fun parts about, you know, uh, my office and some of what we do is you got all these cool technologies around. And so, you know, getting like we've had, uh, we've participated in like manufacturing days where we're like, you know, out at high schools or out at like a convention center where they invite I love doing stuff kids like that. in there. Yeah. And it, it's, it's really cool to see kids walk in and who don't have any kind of exposure to this kind of technology and just watch like their eyes light up that like kind of like blows their mind and and even on a much smaller scale like our offices it's always fun on bring your kid to work day because oh awesome glad you, you know, that. yeah you, you know um kids come into the office and you've got them on like a mobile robot and they're like sitting <laughs> on it riding around or even just the idea of being able to take an iphone and connect it to a mobile robot and they can drive it around like a like a remote control car is oh cool. i mean this course you see here was for people to be able to drive mobile robots around during the pandemic yeah is that what it was? Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. I, th what I thought you might have had like a like a pet or something that uh, was like an obstacle course. For no, we like we let and so it was for uh, ASMEs inspection maintenance robots summit, yeah. and we had these like little like ten pound robots that we let people drive through it uh, over the internet, wherever they were, and we made it like a competition. I think we gave away like quad rotors oh, cool. uh, to the winner, whoever could get through the fastest. And it was originally like we had like different dangers to human life, so. We used to have sparking from that high voltage thing, but it was jamming our Wi-Fi, so we had to get rid of it. <laughs> and then we had uh, tough to do the podcast. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or like drive the robot, even because you know, its communication was Wi-Fi. And then, I mean, the other thing we had was like it was supposed to be like high pressure steam, like that could cut a person in half. But we used a fog machine and like put it through a pipe, and then had it coming out in the middle. Um, and then uh, there was like a hydrogen sulfate leak like simulator where there was just like a thing and a gauge that was depressurized. But what it ended up degenerating into is um, it was just a race. Like nobody gave up. <laughs> like it was more, way more fun to just run it as a time trial. Yeah. And um, I remember I came in with like a Brooks Brothers shirt and like, you know, like pretty conservatively dressed. I think it was in a suit. And um, I lacerated my back. I had to take my shirt off like so many times. Like, no way. Scrunch through the, like there's like <laughs> sand mixed with paint in that tube, and I had to scrunch through and recover the robot because I mean we just built it quickly for an event. It didn't have any kind of self writing or yeah. inverted drive capability. <laughs> so it was just yeah. it, it may be a design flaw too that you would have like the the proverbial quicksand in the middle of the uh, of the tube at the toughest place to. To get in there, or is that, is yeah, that exactly. what you're okay. No, that was it. I mean, it would always collapse in the middle, and there's like these J hooks you can see one of, and people would always um, like catch the robot on that and flip it over. Yeah. And so it was uh, pretty funny. The people that were the best at were the video gamers, like the, the like the younger guys. There's one guy that came in and like was able to interface uh, to the software using a, um, a steering wheel from like a racing game, and it was a 
tank drive robot, and that guy just swept the floor with everyone. Another guy had a joystick, and he plays very high as well. You've seen some of those YouTube videos with guys that are like, uh, like doing drone flights that are like. I remember one? I'd seen one maybe about a year ago that was like through a town and then into a bowling alley and then like <laughs> through a window and then like in a in a party and like weaving through people. And, That's awesome. And and I um and I, you. I, May or may not remember. Um, there, there's a show on HBO at the beginning of every football season called Hard Knocks, and it's a, they pick some NFL team every year and they kind of like walk them through. Uh, the show is about their journey through training camp. Um, and I think like a year or two ago, the Dallas Cowboys was the team that they picked, and one of the shows opened with like a three or four minute drone video. It was like <laughs> mind blowing. Like it's cool. I mean, you know, when when. You know, a mile down the road through cars. Like send me the episode. Yeah, like if, I'll, if, I'll send yeah, you the link. Yeah, I'd be But I remember thinking, and, and and then I remember seeing like a behind the scenes where like the guys, you know, flying it, like looking at a you know on a screen doing that. I mean, hard to believe that you'd have that kind of like accuracy, you know, flying through windows, doors, and it really went throughout the entire Dallas Cowboys facility <laughs> um, in, a, in a single shot. That's awesome, and uh, it was it was pretty cool. And then there was like a blooper reel that showed the you know hundred times that it crashed. <laughs> of course, <laughs> you know, I mean, does anyone that. who's ever demoed a robot knows. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> um, funny story. Just going back to uh, to rethink for a second. The very first demo that we did with that was in our office, and we were in Bridgeville at the time, and uh, we had about fifty customers show up, um, and we were in kind of our conference room, and then. Uh, then after we did like a little bit of a, you know, tease a little bit, uh, you know, the presentation of what this new world's gonna be once collaborative robots are available. And then, you know, go around uh, to the back of the, to the space where we had a, kind of an engineering lab and the demo set up. And uh, a couple engineers from Rethink were getting the robot set up and we were in doing the PowerPoint. And uh, on my corner, we we're so I'm up in front talking, giving the presentation out of the corner of my eye, I see, one of the engineers come into the room and he's going like this. And I'm just like, oh, he needs me to extend the amount of time that I'm, <laughs> that I'm talking here because something's going on with the robot. And uh, uh, sure enough, something, the robot was smoking. Um, Holy crap. And, and they can't even count up, the number of times I've seen that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's always, it's never when you're just like on a Tuesday morning just like playing around, right? I mean, it's always like, when there's important eyeballs uh, on it and you're <laughs> counting on it to do something impressive <laughs> like that, that, that is always the case. Yeah. Um, but uh, sure enough, they ended up, I don't know, bubblegum and duct tape, or I'm not sure what they did, and it ended up, uh, the demo went fine. They must have had spare uh, circuit boards, because once you I, see I, that smoke, you gotta replace something. Yeah, I mean, uh, and so, you know, up there, kind of doing my best, uh, you know, extension of, of whatever handful of slides we were talking about that's that amazing uh, but yeah that's always the way it works yeah no i mean when we were doing this uh thing with driving the robot through the thing there was actually an engineer from dow um who was driving the robot and it just stopped working all of a sudden a bolt had shaken loose from the vibration of the tank drive mm -hmm. and landed on the nvidia jetson board that drove the robot yeah. <laughs> and shorted it out so, I, you know, I think but he luckily was a robotics engineer. He's like, I get it, man. <laughs> yeah. So. I, I think that, that that is the nice thing about when you're dealing with a technical customer base and audience. Uh, well, I, I guess I've seen it both ways. One is they have super high standards, and and they would only you know buy something that's you know foolproof and that's going to work, uh, or they're very. Uh, um, so we're the, the accepting of the fact that this is this happens from time to time, and you know their job is to get difficult, complicated stuff to work all the time, and they understand that uh, you know every once in a while. That's, yeah, and they've got an egg on their face before too. <laughs> so. Who who hasn't? Yeah, for sure. That that extension <laughs> symbol is amazing, by the way. <laughs> yeah, he just walked in. He was like, <laughs> and I remember like. I was like, oh, he needs me to, he's like, you know, like, uh, got it. So the, the other interesting thing about that is, um, and, and I'll remember this day forever because we had a, um, it was a, a local 
uh, 3PL, uh, a company called Genco. It was subsequently acquired by FedEx oh, cool. uh, at, at that meeting in, in um, you know, a C-suite uh, um, fellow was, was at that, uh, that conference and, or at that, that, uh, uh, that demo. And so we, we do the, the demo of Baxter and, and you know, uh, I stand at the front of the room with an audience of 50 people who I'm expecting, like the build up for this has been like, this is something incredible. You know, it's gonna change the world. You know, it's gonna change the world, blah, blah, blah. And so we're expecting like, you know, people just to come up and hand us fistfuls of money and can I take this one home, right? And he stands up in front of the room and says, you know, I came here today prepared uh, to write a check to buy two of these. But based on what I saw today, I can't ever imagine putting one of these in our facility. <laughs> and he's talking about feeling like you oh just my got God. Like yeah, punched it's like in the deflated. gut. Deflated, yeah. yeah. And, um, Brutal. And, uh, and, and you know, we, we tried to recover a little bit from that, but it definitely sucked the air out He of said it. that in front of everyone? In front of everyone. What a dick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, so uh, um, he ended up becoming a really good customer. He's walking out of the door uh, that day and he grabbed me uh, on his way out and he said, uh, hey, Mark, uh, give me a call uh, in a couple of days. Like, uh, I, we'll, we'll figure out how to put a couple of those to use. And um, they ended up being a, a very good customer and, and I think probably one of the larger uh, Rethink Robotics customers in the country. Um, it's, the robots still had plenty of, of challenges and, and we had- I did my master's thesis with a Baxter, so I'm oh, full aware of yeah, the- uh, yeah. Operational limitations well, of the platform. I, I, I mean, I think, um, again, I, maybe we were just so, uh, I, you know, like enamored by the 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 story behind the company and the and the uh, the people at the company, and they had raised one hundred and ten million dollars. Um, you know. Uh, Bezos Expeditions was one of the oh, wow. leading uh, investors, and uh, I, I can't remember what they wound up investing um, over the course of the of the business. But you know, fast forward five years, and they're you know closed up shop. So, um, so I you know I love the fact that they were different. I love the fact that they were approaching things from a like a non traditional way. Like we don't need to write. 10,000 lines of code to get the robot to move from point A to point B. Let's just hold a button on the on the wrist and let's just move it from here to there and that'll, you know, we click two more buttons and it teach it the point. And and that kind of like simple interface I thought was really novel and, and super yeah, unique. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and it was, you know, I think the hardware that the robot was built on, they gave it, you know, its, uh, its joint compliance was all yeah, the series its, elastic was probably a mistake it was all ultimately its downfall because yeah. it just wasn't anywhere near as accurate as it needed to be in order to, to that was it i mean i noticed you'd have like a centimeter of discrepancy a lot of cases or even more sometimes and yeah i think the spec on on sawyer which was the second generation arm was was uh 0.1 millimeter they switched to shunts though they, they got away from series elastic i think right I, I, yeah and and yeah. so and again, that was all maybe part it wasn't Shunt's. Maybe it was. Some I don't kind know of what it was, sense. but that, yeah, I mean, that was all part was. of the uh, part of the story that they were. Um, sorry, I'm just keeping an eye on the time here. No worries. Um, we're at about five two. They, uh, the, it was part of the story that they had to. We had to kind of change because the series elastic actuator was such a, a big part of the whole safety and compliance aspect of a collaborative robot, or at least their their design of a collaborative robot. Um, and it was a great story. It made sense. Unfortunately, it just it led to a robot that wasn't very fast or very accurate. I mean, it had a little bit of like a like a palsy. You know, you're, yeah, you're, you're, used, to, you're used to seeing it, a robot just kind of move swiftly and confidently to a place. And, you know, the Rethink products kind of had to like settle into its position. You know what I mean? Like it, yeah. it took some time and it had to kind of like find its, its way a little bit. And, uh, um, yeah, you know, like I said, I think they they did a ton of things really well. Well, I mean, they issue, they but... built an entire market that's you know, I mean, Fanuc has collaborative robots, Yaskawa has collaborative robots, EBB has collaborative robots. Yeah, I, I think that that, I mean, that, that it does, none of that would exist without rethinking. You're right. I, I think that they they did a lot to legitimize that industry. Again, I I wouldn't be surprised if that industry still succeeded just with UR and what what they were able to do, but. 
but I mean, Rethink was on 60 Minutes, I think, you know, like cover of Time Magazine. I mean, they, 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 they had a lot of kind of good PR around, uh, around that space, and the messaging behind it was, was good. Um, and I remember, you know, whether it was ABB or Fanuc or whoever at the time, you know, they were like, oh, these co-bosses, it's just a fad. Yeah, you know, exactly. Like, that's I, I mean, why would you want, you know, uh, that kind of robot? It's, it's not anywhere near as accurate or as fast. And um, I mean, I don't know what Universal Robots is going to do in, in revenue. It, 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 uh, Terranide's a public company, so I, all yeah. that information is uh, is available. But I mean, I think they just surpassed you know ten or twenty thousand robots in the field or Holy something like shit. that. I mean, they they have a, a massive install base uh, right now. So that's awesome. Uh, and I think the fact that now ABB, Fanuc, Yaskawa, all of the large industrial uh, our manufacturers are now all in on the cobot space. I think really legitimizes what you know. Rethink and you are and some of their other. I completely companies. agree. I did see an interesting cobot setup recently, and I'll wrap this up because I know you're trying to get out of here. Sure. Well. But I, I was at a certain manufacturing facility, and I saw full scale Fanuc robots. I think I mentioned this to you the other day. But they were using area sensors and just full scale giant. You know, could kill you. If you looked at it wrong, Fanuc robots. Yeah. But because of the sensor tech, I mean, they, they sort of trust it to shut down if a person entered the working envelope. Yeah, we, uh, in, kind of in our group, we've done a, we've done a couple uh, robot projects where, um, in, in, through just like a sick safety scanner, uh, but if if designed uh, appropriately, can be done in a way that meets all applicable safety standards uh, in compliance yeah, with that, without, the, without the need of, of hard guarding because you know when, when you have to use hard guarding it really increases the envelope of uh, a work cell uh, by a significant amount um, and and so even if um, so a lot of industrial alarms before they started making cobots adopted the principle of we'll just use an industrial alarm and then a scanner to create kind of like a buffer zone. So if an operator or, or anybody came within, a, you know, the encroachment of the outer zone, the robot would slow down. And then if it came a little closer, then the robot would stop. And um, and I remember, you know, seeing a lot of manufacturers kind of adopt that. But, but we've done like real world applications where you can still have, a, you know, an industrial arm, like a FANUC arm going full speed without hard guarding, but it, as long as it's designed with the appropriate, you know, safety scanners or light curtains or mats or anything like that. So uh, it, the the, the um, safety assessment that needs to be done is a little bit more detailed and and uh, maybe a little bit more advanced than just, you know, just putting up some, some fencing. Um, but I think often it provides a much more flexible and useful work cell uh, for the customers. Yeah, it makes sense to me. I mean, I've seen it in the real world, you know, doing doing good stuff. So that's <laughs> awesome. All right, well, I know you got to get out of here, so I, I guess we can end it. But um, Yeah, I appreciate you having me in. This any, is a lot of fun. Anything you want to plug uh, in the last few moments? Uh, not, not that I can think of. Uh, uh, RG Group is rg-group.com. rg-group.com. Uh, lots, doing lots of cool stuff to try to help promote and uh, advance... Uh, uh, local and regional manufacturers um, trying to leverage a bunch of different technology to help them compete. So that's kind of what, what you know gets me up in the morning is not necessarily you know the, the technology piece itself, but you know I, I love whenever we're able to go in to a customer and really help them you know move the needle for their business and help them kind of succeed and, and, and grow by leveraging automation. So uh, that's awesome. And I mean, there's nothing more rewarding. For sure. Oh, right. Hey, thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Awesome. If you stuck around this long and you like what you've heard, please give us a like and smash that subscribe button. Or smash that like button and give us a subscribe. We're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show. If you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and please come to the next one.